Hello and welcome to Clevy News. We are reaching you live from Nigeria's capital city, Abuja. First, the headlines. In the news, condemnations across the board trail attack on former deputy president of the Nigerian Senate, Ike Okwemadu, in Germany. Benue State Governor Samuel Otom closes his case at the State Governorship Election Petitions Tribunal, expresses confidence of victory. A bomb explosion leaves 63 people dead at a wedding ceremony in the Afghan capital, Kabul. I am Prudent Okuna. The federal government has condemned in strong terms the attack on the former Deputy Senate President, Senator Ike Ekwaramadu, in Nuremberg, Germany. Senator Ekwaramadu, who was attending the second annual Igbo Cultural Festival as a speaker and guest, special guest of honor at the event organized by the Indigo Germany community, was beaten up and publicly humiliated. The chairman of the Nigerian Sin Diaspora Commission, Abike Dabirewa, in a statement on Saturday, described the incident as an embarrassment to the country. Dabirewa stated that some of the culprits who perpetrated the act had been apprehended and called on the German government and law enforcement agencies to ensure that they faced the consequences of their actions. She appealed to Nigerians to be of good behavior wherever they found themselves because such incidents tarnish the image of the country. And the Southeast Governors Forum on Saturday said the IPOP order directing its members to attack them anywhere abroad would not solve the problem of their agitation for Biafra. The chairman of the forum and governor of Ebony State, David Omahi, said that the governors had no problem with members of the outlawed group to warrant such an order, adding that insecurity in the southeast was a nationwide challenge, which was squarely under the federal government's command and control. Condemning the attack on Ekwaramadu, Omahi said if there is any issue I pop holds against the governors, they should come home to settle it in Igbo land instead of a foreign land. He insisted that attacking governors in a foreign land is a wild goose chase, noting that IPOP cannot achieve Biafra alone except with the collaboration of all stakeholders, including the governors. The governors forum warned the members of the proscribed body not to allow political opportunists to use them to destroy the southeast. Governor Mahi, who stated this in a statement signed by his chief press secretary, Imauzo, advised a grief that pop members abroad to come together and work with the governors and the Ohaneze Ndibo to achieve the Igbo presidency come 2023 instead of fighting them. In its reaction to the assault, Ohaneze, the Igbo Apex Social Cultural Organization, Ohaneze Ndibo, also condemned the attack on the former deputy president of the Senate, Senator Ike Akwaremadu, by members of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra in Germany. Ohaneze called on the German law enforcement agencies to bring the perpetrators to justice. It described the assault on Senator Akwaremadu as a disgrace. President General of Ohaneze Chief Nia Ngodo said in a statement that the assault on Ekwaramadu by Igbos in Germany, described as IPOB, is disappointing, grotesque, and dangerous for Igbo solidarity. The statement further said this violent, rude, impatient, divisive, and discourteous style of IPOB or IPOB instigated miscreants is damaging to our cause. It strengthens the case of those who describe them as terrorists and weaken our case against the infringement of our fundamental human rights. Chief Ngodo lamented that Ekwemadu, who negotiated the shorties and securities for Nambikanu's release on bail, does not deserve this picketing and disgrace. He added that a disgrace to Ekwemadu is a disgrace to Igbo race. Also, former Senate leader, Senator Aline Dume, condemned the Saturday's attack on Ekwemadu, saying the IPOB members in Nuremberg, Germany, attacked one of the greatest Nigerian heroes. Ndume, Senate Committee Chairman Onami, said the attack was uncalled for and unwarranted. 
According to him, Akwaramado is one person who has always identified with the Igbo nation at every possible opportunity at Senate plenary since he was elected consecutively to the Senate since 2003. And moving on, pan Yoruba socio-political organization of Eniferi has challenged the Nigerian police to disclose the whereabouts of suspects of Fulani extraction arrested in connection with several cases of kidnapping and killings in southwest states. The group also demanded to know from the police why they have not made their findings known on last month's killing of Mrs. Funke Olakuri, a daughter of Afeni Ferry leader Pa Ruben Fasharonti, in a statement made available to newsmen and signed by its spokesman, Yinka Odumaki, Afeni Ferry said it wants the police authorities to tell Nigerians what they have done with the investigation into the killing of Olakuri and with the various kidnapped suspects arrested and paraded in Ogun, Oshun, and Oyo states. It also asked the police to tell Nigerians if the suspects had been released and on whose orders they were set free. Afeni Ferro noted that the Alafi of Oyo, Oba, Lamidia, Deyemi, has also briefed the organization about how the local security committee in Oyo Axis had arrested 14 kidnapped kingpins who were handed over to the police with none of them paraded by the police or put in trial. It also said the Ogun State Police spokesman Abimbola Oyeyemi on the 28th of July announced that the command arrested 41 king kidnapped suspects, but till date there is no information of their being charged to court. In July this year, the same police, the same Ogun police paraded in Abiokuta suspects implicated in the killing of a 40-year-old farmer, Rafiu Shoe Mimo, in Odeda local government. The paraded suspects are Mohamed Adamu, Saliu Ismail, and Saliu Adam, all Fulani. They are not known to have been prosecuted. And the AB local government area of Taraba State has in the last one week become famous for the killing of three police officers and two civilians after a covert operation by soldiers of the Nigerian army. This report captures the account of residents and the lifestyle of the escaped suspected kidnapped kingpin who is still on the run. Nigerians did not know much about this area until August 6, 2019, when three undercover police officers and two civilians were shot by soldiers of the Nigerian army at Gidin Wire Village while leaving a big town after a covert operation. They had arrested Hamisu Bala, a suspected kidnap kingpin, who is said to be worth over 500 million naira. The kidnap kingpin disappeared from the scene of the incident and is still on the run. Eyewitness account says the vehicle of the police officers was engaged in a hot pursuit by over 200 people on bikes and cars from Ibi town who raised an alarm that Hami Subala was kidnapped. Soldiers at this checkpoint led the chase raining bullets on the police officer's vehicle. The vehicle somersaulted at Gidinwaya village not far from a bridge that links Ebi and will carry local government areas. Not too far from the scene is a police outstation that has been unoperational since 2014. Residents of Gidinwaya said they fled for safety when they heard gunshots from the incident suspecting that a communal war had broken out. Uh, myself and the community were startled by sound of uh, gunshots and uh, I know because I personally I had to shift a little bit I have to relocate because of these gunshots and uh, I know my community too might have done the same thinking that there were enemies coming to harass or to kill or to do whatever they wanted to do so after 30 minutes of uh, Coming out from my hideout, it was a say, that is a hearsay that uh, the military people, that is the personnel, the chase or the pursued kidnappers. Thrown away. As I come back, I see everything scatter, even my shop. Hamid Subala is in his mid-30s, 
and was into fish business, but in the last two years suddenly became wealthy and opened businesses in Ibi. He gained a philanthropic status due to his generosity and became famous. The suspect was living the dream life of most youths with many modern houses in Ibi to his name. He contested for the Taraba State House of Assembly election under the Young Democratic Party, YDP, in the March 2019 general elections and lost. Many residents of Ibi noticed the sudden turnaround in Hamisu's fortune in the last two years, but least suspected he was into criminal activities. His arrest and subsequent escape at Angwan Kofa Wukari on August 6 would open a can of worms and create a rift between the Nigeria police force and the Nigerian army over the killing of policemen by soldiers in the course of the operation. And, uh, in brief, what I would say I know about it is the boy was identified right from his childhood as a trader of fresh and dry fish. That is how we know about him. Later on, not quite alone, he migrated to join politics. He later contested for a uh, House of Assembly. All of a sudden, we got a new development that this is what happened, this is what happened. What happened? That he was a suspected kidnapper. So, it's a new development. But the truth of the issue is that we cannot... The law said the Iron Cuse is, uh, is an innocent until the, uh, the contrary is proved beyond reasonable doubt. So, in brief, when he was, be, if he's been in the table of justice, uh, then he will prove beyond reasonable doubt whether he's a kidnapper or not. But people were shouting kidnappers. Particularly, the accused person shout kidnapper, Sunkamani. That is why people of this town are fearing about that issue. Because those people, they came, there is not a bus or it's not a vehicle for government. It's just like a private vehicle that is computer bus. We, we don't know whether, the people of Ibi don't, don't know whether they have reported to the police station or they have reported to the nearest agency personnel. We don't know. That is why people starting kidnappers, kidnappers, kidnappers when the time that, they, that those people carry him in, put inside moto start going. Then they follow him. When the time Hamisu is outside then those people came they, they kidnap one man beside Hamisu his friend to Hamisu. When they carry him to motor side, one person inside the motor, he say he's not the one. Look at him there. Then they allow this man to go and carry Hamisu put inside motor. People are complaining that the only reason they, they, they close Hamisu eyes with the rapper and then they start moving. Kidnapping for ransom has become common in Taraba State, with millions of naira being paid to abductors to secure the release of victims. How abductors receive such ransom and disappear without any trace of being arrested, however, remains an unsolved mystery. Sunday, a Wolola, the soldier who allegedly raped a female student of Adekunle Adjassin University at Kungba, Koko, Undo State, told a magistrate's court in Akure that he has psychiatric disorder. A Wolola, through his counsel, Kayo De Kotun, said the army transferred him to Akure from Eduguri, the Borno State capital, to take care of his health and family. Kotun pleaded that the suspect whose wife was recently delivered of a child should be granted bail. He had filed a counter affidavit to an application by Adelio Adeshegun, the prosecutor who had demanded that the suspect be remanded in prison for the police to gather more facts. Adeshegu objected to the position of Ikotun and immediately told the court that he had no jurisdiction to hear the rape case. The magistrate, Mayor Wao Lani Pekun, thereafter ordered that the soldier should be remanded at the Olokuta Maximum Prison in Akure, pending legal advice from the Ministry of Justice. 
Olanikpeku also ordered that the original case file of the suspect should be duplicated in the Office of Department of Public Prosecution of the Ministry. He then adjourned the case till November 15th. And a woman identified as Jennifer Nwokocha was on Thursday strangled to death in a hotel room along Woji Road in Port Harcourt, River State. The victim, an indigenous of Ume Kini Ike, Obirikom in Ogba Egbema, Ndon, the local government area of the state, was said to be in her mid-twenties. A lifeless body was discovered in the hotel room with a white piece of cloth tied round her neck. A relative of the victim who spoke on condition of anonymity was said the deceased was also an employee of the hotel but added that he does not know the kind of work she was engaged to do. He however explained that her late father worked with an oil company but after he died Jennifer started having disagreements with her stepmother because she the victim's stepmother refused to give her some of the severance money of her late father and as a result of that she had to cater for her needs another source at the hotel who did not want her name mentioned said that jennifer's killers had already escaped before her corpse was found the source said the deceased body was discovered on thursday morning after the hotel room service knocked at the door several times but there was no response the state's police public relations officer, Nam Diomoni, who confirmed the murder, said some suspects had been arrested and that investigation is ongoing to unravel the incident and bring the culprits to book. You're watching Clearview Television News. We'll be back after this timeout. There is no gain saying the fact that the canker worm called human trafficking is becoming a menace too hot to handle. But the Nigerian government agency responsible for the prohibition of trafficking in persons, NAPTIP, Dame Julie Oka Donley, says Nigeria is winning the war. 90% of those who travel are just sheer ignorance because, I mean, you, you, you will always be a stranger in another man's land. There's no doubt about it. Human trafficking is evil. For those traffickers, who have seen this as a business, it's time to stop because NAPTIP is no respecter of persons. NAPTIP will come after you. You're welcome back. And Department of State Services, DSS, and the London Metropolitan Police Service have received petitions to investigate the documents said to have been obtained from Cambridge University by President Mohamed Bouhari and tendered at the Presidential Election Petitions Tribunal. The separate petitions dated August 14, 2019, were forwarded by a Nigerian lawyer, Kalu Kalu Agu. In the two petitions, Agu questioned the authenticity of the certifying statement said to have been obtained from the Cambridge Assessment International Education. He asked the UK police and the DSS to launch an investigation into the circumstances leading to the procurement. Abba Kiari, the president's chief of staff, had told the tribunal that he obtained the president's assessment documents from Cambridge University. Kiari was quoted as saying that he personally signed for and collected the documents on behalf of the president. The UK-based examination body oversaw the conduct of final year secondary school examination in Nigeria and placement into foreign universities in the 1960s. Governor Samuel Lotom of Benue State on Saturday closed his case at the ongoing Benue Governorship Election Petitions Tribunal in Makudi and expressed confidence that the tribunal will deliver justice 
Governor Tom Hu on Saturday stormed the courtroom with a litany of AIDS party supporters and well-wishers did not give evidence. Speaking on behalf of his client, the lead counsel to the governor, Sebastian Hon, told the tribunal that the governor had decided to close his case after having a cursory look at the evidence presented by the petitioner. Hon, a senior advocate, said the onus of prov proving the case rested with the petitioner and that after taking a critical look at the evidence provided by the petitioners, the defense team have come to the inevitable conclusion that it will not be calling any further witnesses. However, counsel to People's Democratic Party, Oba Maduabuchi, who was next in line to open his case, asked the court to grant him adjournment till Monday, August 19th, to do so. Madu Abuchi, also a senior advocate, said he would call five witnesses and close his case. Both parties in the suit agreed to the request and the tribunal chairman, Justice Henry Lucy, thereafter adjourned the matter to Monday, August 19th. Speaking with journalists after the sitting, Governor Tom expressed confidence in the court to uphold justice, claiming that the 2019 governorship election in Benue was free, fair and credible. On why he decided to call only one witness, so Tom's counsel, Hon, said the statement on oath of the petitioner himself and his star witness for the whole state, Joe Abagu, were not signed and therefore not substantial. Both of Tom and the PDP had requested the court to disqualify Abagu from testifying on the basis that his statements on oath were not signed and proceeded to appeal against the decision of the tribunal to allow the witness to testify. The tribunal had argued that it would rule on the eligibility of the witness to testify in its final judgment on the petition, a position that was upheld by the appeal court. And barely 48 hours after rejecting the National Livestock Transformation Plan proposed by the federal government, the Benue state government has expressed its support for the program. A delegation from the Ministry of Agriculture and Natural Resources led by Dr. Joseph Nyanga, had on Wednesday met with stakeholders in the state on the National Livestock Plan, which was earlier rejected and described as another form of the suspended Ruga project. However, in a statement on behalf of the stakeholders, the Commissioner for Agriculture and Natural Resources, Dr. Timothy Iju, noted that the earlier stand was an uninformed decision. The statement said that after exhaustive deliberations, stakeholders resolved to reconsider their position in view of the fact that they now have enough information to make an informed decision. It was also resolved during the meeting that a technical team of experts be put together to study the NLTP document and identify areas suitable for implementation in Benue State based on peculiarities of the state. The meeting also resolved that the NLTP should be domesticated in Benue State and to ensure that it conforms with the open grazing prohibition and ranches establishment law of the state. Ikizi State Governor Dr. Kayo Defiami has proposed a bond to enable his administration to offset the arrears of gratuities of pensioners. Governor Fayemi, who stressed the need to address the challenges confronting the state, said government would soon organize the bond to offset the outstanding gratuities of pensioners and later find a way of paying back. The governor disclosed this in Adoikiti at a meeting with the United Nations Systems Residence Coordinator Edward Callan, who was in the state to support Ikiti State to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. A statement from the Chief Press Secretary to the Governor, Yinka Oyebode, on Saturday said the state is desirous of a close collaboration with the UN to push for a world of peace, progress and development that can help address governance deficits which undermine sustainable development over the long term. Speaking earlier, Carlon said the potential areas of partnership with Nigeria included advocacy for legislation on the establishment of the National Commission for peace, reconciliation and mediation and deepening the understanding of the SDGs in partnership with the Nigeria Governors Forum. A civil society organization, Independent Public Service Watch, has called on the embattled head of 
the civil service of the Federation Winifred Oyoita to resign following allegation of financial fraud totaling 3 billion naira leveled against her. The group in a statement on Friday in Abuja and signed by its executive secretary, Opanachi Jacob, vowed to commence a nationwide protest against Oyoita if she fails to resign within 72 hours. The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, ESCC, is investigating Oyoita over the alleged 3 billion naira contract scam, abuse of duty toll, allowance, money laundering, among others. The group said it would henceforth take legal action against the likes of Oyoita to ensure that public servants facing corruption trial vacate their seats pending the outcome of their investigation. The statement said it is worrisome and unacceptable that the head of civil service of the Federation that is central to the fight against corruption is involved in corrupt practices. It further noted that there is no way the service can be reformed when its head is enmeshed with series. The anti-corruption crusade of the present administration of President Muhammad Bari is continuing to receive endorsements across the strata of the Nigerian society. The latest show of support is coming from religious and traditional leaders in Akwaibom state who have promised to promote uprightness among their adherents and subject as the anti-graft war gathers momentum. As our correspondent now tells us, the occasion was a one-day anti-corruption town hall meeting in Uyo, the state capital. A roll call of who is who and the religious and traditional institutions in Akwaibom state. They constitute the body referred to as moral institutions. These men of Anara gathered here for a cause to brainstorm on how to fight corruption in their domains and chiefdoms. This is happening courtesy Peering Advocacy and Advance Center in Africa, PAACA, with the theme Strengthening the moral institutions in building a corrupt free society. Their critical roles in this fight was emphasized by the executive director of PAACA, Ezenwa Nwago. So the traditional and moral, uh, the moral institutions as we call them, the traditional institutions and the religious institutions have a lot of following. And the influence that they have will help us redirect the conversation against corruption. Participants were unanimous in their opinions as there was need for them to step up the campaign in their areas of influence. Truly, there has been effectiveness of the practicality of uh, the anti-corruption crusade we are talking about. Then that person, whoever is, whatever goes up, will always come down. And once it comes down, the immunity clause will not protect the person any longer. They have to start from themselves. Because if you are not upright, you cannot correct other people. Deal with responsibility. The, the people's money is entrusted in you. You have to use it judiciously. It's not only giving and taking that is corruption. If they give you this money for social project and you divert it to another project that is not meant for, the money is not meant for, it's also corruption. Governments at various levels were not left behind in this clarion call. The forum agreed there is the need for government to strengthen the traditional institution to fight the master effectively through more constitutional backings, adequate funding, and last but not the least, good leadership by example. The Nigerian Defense Academy, Kaduna State, has released its admissions list of a 71 regular combatant corps into the armed forces, comprising 660 intakes, with only 41 females. The breakdown shows that each of the 36 states had 18 candidates, while the federal capital territory, Abuja, had 12 intakes. There were 11 states and the FCT which had no females among the candidates. The states are Edo, Taraba, Yobe, Jikawa, Kano, Kasina, Sokoto, Gombe, Zamfara, Oyo, Niger, and the FCT Abuja. According to the NDA Registrar Brigadier General I.M. Jalo, the Academy cadets who are to report with clothing materials and a laptop would resume on the campus on September 1, 2019. The Armed Forces Selection Board interview for the 71 regular combatant intake was held from June 24th to August 10th. 
Selected candidates are not allowed to receive visitors and will not leave the academy for the first four months of training. Successful candidates will be subjected to toxicology or drug tests on resumption. Brigadier General Jalo said failing the test would lead to automatic disqualification. You're watching Clearview Television News. We'll be back after this timeout. There is no gain saying the fact that the canker worm called human trafficking is becoming a menace too hot to handle. But the Nigerian government agency responsible for the prohibition of trafficking in persons, NAPTIP, Dame Julie Okadonli, says Nigeria is winning the war. 90% of those who travel are just sheer ignorance because, I mean, you, you, you always be a stranger in another man's land. There's no doubt about it. Human trafficking is evil. For those traffickers who have seen this as a business, it's time to stop because NAPTIP is no respecter of persons. NAPTIP will come after you. There is no gain saying the fact that the canker worm called human trafficking is becoming a menace too hot to handle. But the Nigerian government agency responsible for the prohibition of trafficking in persons, NAPTIP, Dame Julie Okadonli, says Nigeria is winning the war. 90% of those who travel are just sheer ignorance because, I mean, you, you, you always be a stranger in another man's land. There's no doubt about it. Human trafficking is evil. For those traffickers who have seen this as a business, it's time to stop because NAPTIP is no respecter of persons. NAPTIP will come after you. Welcome back from that break. And moving on, top dignitaries gathered in Abuja on Saturday to mark the 80th birthday celebration of former ch national chairman of the ruling All Progressives Congress, APC, John Odigye Oyegun. 
Among them were Vice President Professor Yemi Ushibajo, APC National Chairman Adam Sushomale, and some state governors, including Godwin Obaseki of Edo, Kayode Fayemi of Ekiti, Atiku Bagudu of Kebi, and Nasru Erufai of Kaduna. Others were Governor Simon Lalong of Plateau, Abdullahi Gaduje of Kanu, and Mohamed Badaru of Jigawa State. Also in attendance were some former governors who served during the same period, Odige Oyegun held sway as the governor of Edo State. The secretary to the government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa, represented President Muhammad Buhari, while Nigeria's former permanent representative to the United Nations, Professor Ibrahim Gambari, was the guest speaker. Vice President Oshibajo, who was the special guest of honor, said he had always admired Oyegun for two reasons. He said first is that somehow he has always been his own man charting his own course, sometimes making some real trouble. For example, when as a federal permanent secretary, he risked content proceedings when he refused to testify on principle. Second is that somehow Oyego manages to be so deep in the politics of Nigeria, yet he doesn't ever look like a politician. He sounds always like a fine, well-bred, well-spoken gentleman dragged into politics. But indeed, he is a consummate politician and an astute strategist. Born on August 12, 1939, Oyegun, according to Professor Shibajo, almost always finds himself on the right side of history. As a founding member of AD, member of NADECO, and founding member of the APC and its first chairman, one who led the party to its historic victory to unseat the ruling party in 2015. The vice president said people like Oyegun had shown that politicians could be loyal, faithful men and women. Gambari, in his lecture, noted that Nigeria was at a time in its history where the forces of unity and those of fragmentation were in very stiff competition. And the federal capital territory Administration says it will collaborate with the Directors Guild of Nigeria to celebrate its 20th anniversary coming up in November in Abuja. Permanent Secretary, Federal Capital Territory Administration, Christian Chiakaoha, made the pledge when he received members of the DGN and other prominent Nollywood actors and actresses who paid him a cut to visit to the FCTA. While congratulating the DGN for its 20th anniversary, Oha said the FCTA had all the necessary departments that could collaborate with the Directors Guild of Nigeria effectively in its quest to take the industry to greater heights. Speaking earlier, the president of the Directors Guild of Nigeria, Fred Amata, stressed the need for more interface between government and the Nollywood industry in order to give to move the industry to the desired level. A matter who appealed to the government to create favorable policies for the industry solicited the support of FCTA in the area of capacity building for artists on the contributions of the guild to the Nigerian entertainment industry. Amata said the DGN and its retinue of directors can boast responsibility for the biggest projects the industry started with, creating and nurturing the biggest actors, biggest structures, biggest engagements, and creating the biggest icons the industry knows till date. He also commended the FCTA for always supporting the industry, particularly in the establishment of the Abuja Film Village International and the staging of the annual Abuja Carnival. Among the table actors on the visit were Shegun Arinze, Kanayo Kanayo, Kate Henshaw, Tony Akposheri, and Francis Duru. It was fun like never before this Sunday as the teens of Four Square Gospel Church at Sokoro Abuja rounded off their teens week. The service was characterized by music, rendition, drama, preaching, art exhibition and more. Clairview's religious affairs correspondent Chine Dumbatwegu has the details. To honor the teens of Fosca Gospel Church at Sukuru, the pulpit was yielded to one of them to deliver the first part of the sermon. The teen girl admonished the congregation to always put God first in all their dealings. The potter and the creative person, he's an artist. He's a creative person. 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 He's a cre
he loves his work. And that is why he was able, he, he now have the mind to replace us because each and every one of us, we are all special. We are all special to him. And he takes his time to do all these things for us. He doesn't talk to anything and he never gets tired of us. Even though we keep going through things, we keep coming back to God, we go back again, we come back, we go, we come back, we just back and forth. But he will never get tired of you. Delivering the second part of the sermon, Pastor Blessed re echoed the earlier charge when he harped on the fact that human beings are clay in the hands of God, the potter. He lamented the practice where man commits sin repeatedly each time God forgives. How many times will you be man in the hand of God? How many times will you be no matter how many times you keep going out of his presence and doing some things that he doesn't do, as much as you come back, that God is willing to preach you together and do that which is good to him. But I want to ask you, church, excuse me, sir. How many times do you continue to be man in the hand of God? As expected of the teenagers, Dear was fun. reporting for Clearview Television. And moving on to the foreign scene, Argentina's economy minister, Nicolas Dujovun, has resigned amid a financial crisis exacerbated by the president's defeat in a primary poll. The country's peso shed 20% of its value against the U.S. dollar after President Mauricio Macri suffered the resounding loss last Sunday. In a letter to the president, Dujovin said he had given his all. President Macri was defeated in the primary elections by his left-wing rival, Alberto Fernandez. Fernandez's running mate is former President Cristina Fernandez de Krichna, who presided over an administration remembered for a high degree of protectionism and heavy-handed state intervention in the economy. He won the primary with 47.7% of the votes, with President Macri receiving 32.1%. Following the primary results, credit rating agencies Fitch and Standard and Poor's downgraded the country's debt rate and amid concerns about a possible future def default. Days after the defeat, President Macri announced a series of measures including income tax cuts and increases in welfare subsidies. Petrol prices with also, will also be frozen for 90 days. Macri was elected in 2015 on promises to boost Argentina's economy with a sweep of liberal economic reforms. And a bomb explosion at a wedding hall in Kabul, the Afghan capital, on Saturday killed 63 people and wounding more than 180 other guests. Already, the Islamic State group IS has claimed responsibility for the attack. An IS statement said that one of its fighters blew himself up at a large gathering while others detonated a packed explosives laden vehicle when emergency services arrived. President Ashraf Ghani has condemned the attack, describing it as barbaric. He blamed the Taliban for providing a platform to, for terrorists. However, the Taliban has denied involvement and condemned the attack. The Afghan Interior Ministry confirmed the death toll hours later. Pictures on social media showed bodies strewn across the wedding hall amid overturned chairs and tables. The bride's father told local media that 40 members of his family were killed in the attack. Afghan weddings often include hundreds of guests 
who gather in large halls where the men are usually segregated from the women and children. An massive fire has swept through a slum in the capital of Bangladesh, Dhaka, leaving thousands of people homeless. At least 1,200 tin sharks were destroyed in the Shanlatik Tika slum late on Friday. No deaths uh, were, have been reported, although several people were injured. Emergency officials said many homes had plastic roofs, which helped the flames to spread. Most residents are low-wage earners and many were away after the Muslim festival of Eid al-Adha. The cause of the fire is still unknown, while the number of people made homeless by the fire is unclear, but estimated at between 3,000 and 10,000. The junior minister for disaster management and relief, Enamur Rahman, said 1,200 shanties were damaged and out of these 750 shanties were burned totally. He said relief will be provided for the many thousands who are now, shelter, who are now sheltered. A fire official, Ershad Hussein, said some 10,000 people are currently being sheltered in schools that were shot for the festival. Five attorneys general of U.S. states and city have filed a lawsuit against a new immigration policy by President Donald Trump administration to deny possible permanent residency to immigrants who receive some federal benefits. California is leading the coalition and its attorney general, Sevier Becerra, was joined by his counterparts from the states of Maine, Oregon and Pennsylvania, as well as the District of Columbia to challenge Trump's policy to restrict immigrants' access to legal status if they use food or medical benefits offered by the federal government. Becerra said in the lawsuit filed in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California that the new policy, also known as the Department of Homeland Security Public Charge Rule, is targeting working immigrants and their families by creating unnecessary new barriers to lawful admission to the U.S. You're watching Clearview Television News. We'll be back after this timeout for sports. Foundation. <laughs> Television. <laughs> There is no gain saying the fact that the canker worm called human trafficking is becoming a menace too hot to handle. But the Nigerian government agency responsible for the prohibition of trafficking in persons, NAPTIP, Dame Julie Oka Donley, says Nigeria is winning the war. 90% of those who travel are just sheer ignorance because, I mean, you, you, you will always be a stranger in another man's land. There's no doubt about it. Human trafficking is evil. For those traffickers, who have seen this as a business, it's time to stop because NAPTIP is no respecter of persons. NAPTIP will come after you.
Yo, welcome back. And former Super Eagles coach Sam Sinsiasia is heading for the court to seek legal advice on the life ban imposed on him over alleged match fixing by world football governing body FIFA. Speaking through his representative of Pukari Jones area in Abuja this Saturday, Siasia and his legal team are studying the FIFA letter banning him and will get to the bottom of it. Appeal to you again that uh, let's let's just let it go. As soon as possible, he will get to you and make a formal statement consigning the issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the lawyers, you know, this thing came out by noon or by noon yesterday. So we believe that the lawyers will take maybe two working days and they will get back and a proper mm -hmm. uh, press briefing will be made. I can assure you that. Of course, of course. Uh, we were actually, we just spoke on the phone um, because we've been, we've, been run, we've been trying to do a project somewhere. So we just, I just got off the phone with him and 15 minutes later, a friend of mine called me and said, have you heard? I said, what again? He now said, um, something has been banned by FIFA. I said, no, just forget it. It's uh, fake news. Another call came in and I said, okay, let me just cross check. So I went on to the net and checked, and I saw it from, it was first, I saw it on Eurosports. So I went to their website, I confirmed it. Another friend called me, next thing, Facebook messages, and the news went viral. So I called him back and asked if he had heard. He said, well, that somebody sent him the same way I got the message, he got it. And we're all surprised because there was no, on my part, there was no rumor, no news, no... There was no, there was nothing on the air regarding this, you know. So it took me by surprise. I'm still in shock as I speak to you, because I had to go to FIFA website to confirm that this is from FIFA. And there was this report that Sia Sia reacted that he was not aware of it. Nobody ever called him. Well, you, it, the way you read it, that's the way I read it. Because I wasn't there when he made the report. You know, so and because of the shock, I've not even bothered to ask him why ask him what was that. The lawyer is looking at the case, and at the appropriate time, we'll, we'll get back. We'll get back to everybody. Talking about the lawyer, how do you people hope to go about this? I don't know. I don't know. It's, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a legal thing, so I cannot speak on behalf of the lawyer. Friday's decision by World Football Governing Body FIFA to ban Samson Siasia for life. Is not going down well with Nigerians, many of whom have been have given a nod to his decision to seek legal redress at the Court of Arbitration for Sports CAS. Nigerian journalists who turned out in large numbers for the World Press Conference. Called by Siasia spokesman in Abuja hours after the live ban by FIFA was announced, said the only way to find solution to the issue is to seek redress in court. He didn't even get a fair hearing, then that means he should seek legal grounds because at the end of the day, you find out that this is called defamation of character. You cannot do that to someone of some of someone that has a reputable um, um, status to actually um, uphold. You can't do that. He's our own, yes. But at the end of the day, if he is found guilty, yes, he can face the news. But right now, FIFA needs to tell us more. They're not saying anything. That is the a, a better, better step to, to take when you are dealing with an international uh, organization like uh, association like uh, FIFA like that. But if you look at the uh, scenario critically, I don't think uh, FIFA uh, is uh, toiling a, a, a better a better path because uh, this uh, uh, allegation yeah, he has not been served like the report we had, even from the BBC report we had. We I read. He has not been served. How on earth you will, you are yet to serve someone that okay, this is your offense he, to give him privilege even to defend himself as a coach. You have not given him that privilege. And then apart from that, you ban someone for life, and then you are still putting price of fifty thousand dollars. No, I don't. I don't believe in that. I believe in uh, Siasia telling the whole world. I don't believe in that. I believe in Siasia telling the whole world what really transpired against uh, him concerning this uh, corruption case. You don't need to hide behind it. If you have done it, 
tell you, oh, yes, I've done it. If you didn't do it, say, yes, I did not do it, period. We don't need to have a, what I want to say, legal, maybe we want to consult our legal advices. No, I don't believe in that. And before we go, a look at our top stories. Condemnations are still trailing the attack on former Deputy President of the Nigerian Senate, Ike Ekwermadu, in Germany by members of the indigenous people of Biafra, Ipo. Benue State Governor Samuel Tom has expressed confidence of victory after closing his case at the State Governorship Election Petitions Tribunal. And we also told you that a bomb explosion has left 63 people dead and 180 others wounded at a wedding ceremony in the Afghan capital, Kabul. And that's the news. Remember that you can subscribe to our YouTube channel via Clearview TV, like us on Facebook via Clearview Television, follow us on Twitter at Clearview Online, follow us on Instagram at Clearview TV underscore NG. You can also watch Clearview TV on Night Comsat with any free-to-air decoder. For details, contact your local installer. I am Prudent Okona and thanks for watching.